So what I can't tell is what Congress thinks uh, the internet companies are going to do that they're not currently doing that should be done that actually won't cause massive collateral damage or possibly little or no gain. And the answer is maybe Congress doesn't really care about CCF. Hello and welcome to another edition of Prostasia Foundation's podcast broadcast series, Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. Today I'm joined by Professor Eric Goldman from Santa Clara University School of Law. He's a, an expert on internet law and policy and co-director of Santa Clara's High Tech Law Institute. So thank you very much for joining us today, Eric. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So we're here today to talk about a proposed law called Earn It. Now, who is this directed towards? What are they being asked to earn? And how are they being asked to earn it? The high-level approach is that uh, Congress wants internet companies to do more to combat uh, child sexual abuse material, or CSAM, or if it use the term CSA. Um, and in order to do that, they want to make um, the internet companies take, uh, earn their protection under a law called Section 230 um, by checking off a bunch of boxes that, that a commission will specify. If the company can check off those boxes, then they'll continue to be eligible for this existing protection that Section 230 provides. If they don't check out the boxes, then a bunch of new liability could attach to them that could radically change their liability posture. So Section 230, I've heard of this described as a, a safe harbor law. Is that what it is? Can you describe to us a little bit about how Section 230 operates? Yeah, I actually call it an immunity because it's designed to preempt the lawsuits before they're even filed. It's a very powerful way of, of creating a safe zone for certain types of activity. The basic architecture of Section 230 says that websites or other online services aren't liable for third-party content. So as long as uh, it's third-party content, they can basically say, it's not my problem, take it up with whoever's engaged in the criminal or tortious activity. There are some exceptions to that, and I know we'll talk about them. One of the main exceptions is that it doesn't cover federal criminal prosecutions. So there are plenty of federal crimes that still apply to online services that could be based on third-party content. But if it doesn't fit exceptions, the online services aren't liable for the fact that, for example, users might distribute CSAM through their tools. So if a user does do that and a platform doesn't take action, um, they know about this content being on their server and they don't do anything about it, uh, what's their liability at the moment, before earning? The basic architecture is that if it is CSAM and it's being distributed using a, a, an online service, that the online service isn't liable for it, even if they know about it. Now, there's a couple of qualifications that we will have to make. First, the online service is obligated to notify an organization called NICMIC uh, about the existence of any CSAM that they become aware of. So the moment that they know about it, then they have to contact law enforcement basically to say, we've identified criminal activity on our service, here's the details so that you can pursue it. Sometimes NICMIC would prefer that that content not be completely deleted so that there's a forensic trail for law enforcement to follow. Other times they want it gone as soon as possible. Um, then uh, if a service were to know that it was uh, supporting people who are distributing CSAM, then federal criminal law might apply. Federal criminal law does apply to knowingly engaging in certain activities that might include the distribution of CSAM. And as a result, uh, even if Section 2 doesn't apply, there still might be federal criminal law. So what we normally encounter is one of two things. Either the site doesn't know about it, in which case they're not liable, once after the fact that people learned that the site was used to distribute CSAM, or they know about it, they take it down, they contact law enforcement, and eliminate the liability that way. So you've said a little bit about how Earnit will work already. There's going to be a commission that's going to come up with guidelines. Platforms are going to have to follow those guidelines or take other steps to, um, to address their new potential liability. But you and I are both lawyers. A lot of people viewing this won't be lawyers. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of maybe a law student at Santa Clara um, five years from now. How is their experience of the internet likely to be affected if the Earn It Act is in place. It's a little bit early to speculate about that because we don't know what the commission is going to recommend. It could recommend that actually today everything is status quo, keep on doing that, no big deal. Um, in which case, it would be a weird di di detour, but it wouldn't really change uh, a lot of behavior. Another set of scenarios is that the commission recommends things that are extremely onerous to the internet. And I'm just going to mention a couple. 
One is that one of the, the likely targets of the law, one of the main justifications for the law, is that there's a hope among members of Congress that the commission will ban end-to-end -end encryption. They could do that one of two ways. They could say that the service cannot engage in end-to-end -end encryption, um, and therefore the service must either have a backdoor or can't use encryption at all. Or they could say the service must somehow try and find any, any messages that are encrypted that they're carrying, even if they weren't provided by encryption tools from the service, and block those as well. Obviously, if encryption were to go away, that's going to change a number of people's experiences because of how much certain communities depend upon encryption. Another thing that the commission could recommend is that the um, uh, online services authenticate every user so they can turn over to law enforcement not just the details about CSAM, but who actually was uh, uh, distributing it or receiving it. Um, so like that would change the internet at a very radical level because we now have the possibility of engaging in pseudonymous or anonymous activity online. If that were one of the rules, it might become um, that all content is attributed and a bunch of things that people are currently comfortable doing only anonymously and pseudonymously would go away. So I've heard also this law being compared to FOSTA. Are there similarities with FOSTA, the anti-sex trafficking law, and are there any key differences? Uh, there's some significant uh, commonalities with FOSTA. FOSTA basically said, Section 230 is still in place, but we're going to carve off two categories of liability that now are newly exposed, that Section 230 no longer covers. That will include uh, state criminal prosecutions, and civil lawsuits. And uh, the Earn It Act would do the same. If a site doesn't apply with the checkbox items from the commission, then they would face new liability under uh, the uh, state crimes as well as the um, uh, civil claims. The civil claims could be uh, state claims. They could also be claims that are existing under federal cr cr criminal law that are preempted by, uh, by Section 230. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's similar. What's different is that FOSTA didn't create this minimum checklist of obligations. It didn't create this commission slash censorship board to try and tell internet sites what they must do in order to avoid liability. We might say that could end up being a good thing. If the commission gives us a well-defined checklist of things to do, everyone knows what they have to do. It also is possible that the checklist that comes out of the commission will be far more onerous than whatever people have to do to comply with FOSTA. So I guess that depends on the composition of the commission, right? So there's 16 members. Who are they? So uh, it's a little bit unclear about exactly what the composition of the commission is going to look like, because that's changed in the, from the first to the second draft, and we don't know if it's going to continue further change. But the basic structure is that there are seven people who are clearly law enforcement, plus two NGOs that are supposed to be uh, advocates of victims of uh, child uh, of CSAM. Um, those nine votes are likely all to support anything that law enforcement asks for. Um, there are four representatives from internet companies, two from big companies, two from smaller companies. Now let's assume that they vote together, although they might not. That's four votes that um, uh, would be aligned uh, to support the internet company's interests. Then there are three remaining votes, two from technologists and one from a privacy expert. Um, those ones are a little bit unclear which way they could go. Some of those people might be sympathetic to internet companies. Some of them might be sympathetic to law enforcement. Some of them might be on some different spectrum altogether. So actually knowing how the commission is going to be um, voting is a little bit unclear because of those three wobble votes. In order for anything to get out of the commission, it's going to need 11 yes votes. Remember, they already have nine likely votes for law enforcement. Or there needs to be six clear no votes. And remember, there are four internet company votes. So there's a, those three votes in the swing are the ones that would likely determine the outcomes. And who decides in the end? But also, how are these recommendations enforced? Or perhaps they're not enforced. Are they binding or not? So uh, the commission would uh, uh, promulgate regulations once they get the requisite 11 votes. They would go to what appears to be, in the latest draft, a, a brain trust of the, um, uh, the Attorney General of the United States, um, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, and the chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And it's unclear what that brain trust will do because there was a change from draft one to draft two and it didn't actually nail it down all the details. So we don't know if they have to agree, all three of them, if two of the three can agree, if the AG just needs to talk to the other two and has a final decision making authority, we're not clear what will happen. Once something gets out of that brain trust, however that will work, 
Uh, Congress has a chance to disapprove it. It becomes presumptively law, but Congress has 90 days to disapprove it. Now, the mechanisms for disapproval are extremely ornate. They're very baroque. There's 10 out of the 30 pages of law are dedicated just to how Congress could disapprove. They really don't want Congress to disapprove anything. Um, and then, uh, assuming that Congress doesn't disapprove anything, then what emerges from the brain trust becomes a set of, uh, a safe harbor, basically. A site can now say, I have complied with everything in safe harbor and therefore I'm presumptively eligible for uh, this uh, Section 230 protection. Um, they have to self-certify, uh, I'm sorry, the United States have to self-certify uh, that they have complied with all the recommendations from the commission. And so long as they do so and no one enforces it, that uh, no one double checks them, then they're good to go. They can plead Section 230 uh, as an immunity. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why that might not be as simple. Um, for example, I don't know who's going to be signing that certification, but I'll tell you, I would not put my liberty on the line for that. So I'm not sure who's going to be stepping up to do that. So the states involved with actually certifying that someone has complied with the recommendations of the commission um, are going to be pretty high. A site could simply say, you know what, we're going to ignore the commission altogether. And the statute has a fallback that says, so long as the site is taking reasonable measures to mitigate CSAM, they're also still eligible for Section 230. But nobody knows what those standards are going to be, and I'm guessing that most companies are going to feel very uncomfortable relying upon that. So the guidelines are going to be voluntary, um, but they're voluntary only with this very massive set of coercion about the risk of losing Section 230. So... Isn't it a good idea, though, to make it more risky for technology companies to uh, enable the promulgation of CSAM on their networks? Isn't there some social good that this law is, is trying to promote? Uh, absolutely. You know, we should be vigilant against CSAM. And I'm glad that Congress is thinking about the ways to do that. The problem is that they've totally missed the mark on what it takes to fight CSAM. There's a presumption built into the statute, not articulated, that internet companies aren't doing enough. And actually, as we know, and as I'm guessing most of your viewers know, CSAM is the most regulated content by internet companies. They take the greatest steps to try to prevent it from being distributed and to respond to it once they identify it. Um, there's nothing else that is even close in terms of the, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the investment on the part of the internet companies to combat it. Um, so what I can't tell is what Congress thinks uh, the internet companies are going to do that they're not currently doing, that should be done, that actually won't cause massive collateral damage or possibly little or no gain. And the answer is, maybe Congress doesn't really care about CCM. Maybe this is the back door for a censorship board called the Commission to promulgate a bunch of things that will crack down on internet content more generally, and the fact that it might be done a help with CSAM is almost like a side benefit. Um, so there's a lot of skepticism about uh, the real goal of trying to up the game of the internet companies to fight CSAM, given the state of the art today. So it may be more that everyone hates child sexual abuse material, putting that into a law is going to make that law more likely to pass, the same way that child sex trafficking was the original motivation for Foster, perhaps. It's, a, it's like clockwork. Um, every election year, we see something new to protect the kids, online, and this is, uh, this is the newest version of that. Um, we've seen that for decades, so this is nothing new. Um, but it's so depressing to think that it could be uh, a cynical attempt to use CSAM and the victims of child sexual abuse um, as just a pawn in the game to, to crack down on uh, the internet more generally. I hope that's not the case. So if, if we put the best possible interpretation on earning, and it really is an attempt to deal with this problem, um, You've, you've suggested it's not the right approach. Um, we also know that uh, penalties against individuals for sharing CSAM are pretty astronomical and you know, doubling them or tripling them is probably not going to make much more of a dent in this problem either. Um, so this may be an unfair question to you because it may not be your area of uh, speciality, but are there any other approaches that you think we could take to the problem of CSAM that would be more effective than a law like Earned? So uh, this isn't my expertise, but I will say a few words about it. Um, my understanding from a number of people I've spoken with uh, is that there's just an under-enforcement of um, violations that are being notified by the internet companies per Congress's request going into NICMIC, which farms out to a group of 62 organizations called the ICAC um, that are uh, in uh, 62 different geographies throughout the country. They're getting this inflow of reports all the time, and my understanding is that many of them are not being acted upon. 
And so if Congress really wants to make a dent on CSAM, we already have a really good uh, trail that they can follow. All these un, uh, un, under-enforced or unenforced reports that are coming in, I think we ought to stop there. Uh, we ought to start there. So um, if this law is passed, is it going to be vulnerable to constitutional challenge in your opinion? Um, that's a really complicated question because we don't yet know what the commission is going to recommend. And so until we see the commission's recommendations, it's uh, much more abstract to attack it um, constitutionally. But my view is after some of the cases involving trademark registrations for things that the government doesn't like, which were deemed unconstitutional, where the government refused to grant a privilege based on unconstitutional standards, it seems that, that the Earned Act is potentially vulnerable to a categorical challenge by conditioning the privilege, Section 230, on potentially unconstitutional activity on the part of uh, the Internet company. So I think there is likely uh, some constitutional limits, but until we see the recommendations, it's a little bit abstract. I'm not sure we'll see that challenge at the inception. So where are we with this act? At the moment, it's just a proposal, right? It's not even in Congress yet. Um, where is this likely to go and how long is it likely to take? Uh, so, uh, it has not yet been introduced. Um, we haven't seen the version that will be introduced, and it's possible, I think even probable, that the version I saw, that I'll call draft two from early February, uh, will be uh, modified by, uh, for its final introduction. So, when we see that, then we'll actually really be able to see where uh, the proponents are drawing the line in the sand and saying, this is what we're really prepared to stand behind. Um, once it gets introduced, then a uh, typical process will be for the proponents to go in and rally up their colleagues to co-sponsor it. Um, with FOSS, as you may recall, there were dozens of sponsors in uh, the Senate and uh, hundreds in the uh, House. And so, you know, by the time that it came to vote, it was pretty clear all these co-sponsors were either going to have to renege on their co-sponsorship or they were already a yes vote. The fate was sealed. Um, it's possible that stuff like that will take place. However, I do think that there's going to be some questions among the potential co-sponsors about exactly what does this law do and why is it being done this way? And do we really trust that this is the best mechanism? Among other things, it puts a lot of power in the hands of our, our attorney general. And right now, I think there's a lot of questions whether our attorney general is actually representing America's interests and the behavior that he's uh, engaging in. So do we really want to put more power in, that, in, in the hands of uh, that person? And more generally, it's a broad delegation of authority by Congress to this commission. Um, is that really how Congress should handle um, the, the really important questions in CSAM? To basically say, it's too hard for us, go uh, put these, uh, these um, uh, uh, commission members to try and figure out what we can't figure out? It strikes me that Congress really ought to think carefully about that delegation. So it's not obvious to me that there's going to be a roll-up of co-sponsors. But it's a very dangerous bill because of the fact that in order to oppose it, the, 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 uh, uh, the counter-argument is now you support CSAM, and yeah. nobody wants to do that. Yeah. So do we already have an idea of who's lining up uh, in favor or against, or is it too early to say? Uh, we do know that the drafter is uh, uh, Senator uh, Graham's office, that Senator Blumenthal is uh, working with Senator Graham, which makes it a bipartisan bill. Um, and that, of course, also makes it dangerous because Congress normally is gridlocked on anything that's partisan. But if this is a nonpartisan effort or a bipartisan effort, um, that gets around a lot of potential um, gridlock. Um, I haven't yet heard who else is going to line up for or against, and it's probably too early to tell. So how can our viewers or listeners uh, track this bill and find out more? Well, obviously, when it's introduced, there will be a lot of coverage about it. Um, and please, listeners, uh, viewers, um, uh, make sure that you understand that this is not really a battle between uh, law enforcement and the technology companies. There's a general presumption um, among a lot of people that Section 230 is a gift to the technology companies, and it makes them uh, richer at the expense of everyone else. Section 230 is a gift to all of us as users of the Internet. What we're really fighting for is what will the Internet look like at the end of this commission report, once the Internet companies face all this greater liability, what are they going to look like? And chances are they're not going to let us do the things that we enjoy today in the same format. And that's worth fighting for. So um, when the listeners hear it, they should, A, discount the headlines, tech companies oppose the Earned Act, because that's not really who's the opposition. The opposition is all of us. Um, 
and uh, they should, of course, contact, contact their members of Congress. This will absolutely be one where if members of Congress are hearing from their constituents about um, the support or opposition to this bill, they will respond. They do are they are accountable to us as voters. So this is a place where getting on the phone, not just an email, not just a tweet, but getting on the phone, calling the staff and saying, you know what, I love the internet, I want to fight CSAM, but this is not the way to do it, um, will be extremely helpful. So I encourage all your viewers, listeners, please, 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 um, we are going to be in the fight for the internet as we currently think of it today. Um, and we can make a difference. Great. Well, that's very inspiring. Uh, thank you very much for leading us through this bill, and uh, let's all hope for the best. Thanks for the opportunity. Great talking with you. Okay. And thank you for tuning in. Join us again next month for another episode of Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Bye-bye for now.